Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you all. And uh, we uh, bring greetings from Oklahoma. And that's for my wife and I. From my wife, Cheryl's here with me. Cheryl, why don't you stand up? Everybody see Cheryl. My wife, stand up back there. Come on now. The uh, greatest blessing in my life, other than God saving me, is giving me my, my wife, Cheryl. So she's a tremendous blessing to me in my life and in our family. And uh, we, uh, we had a prophecy conference at our church about six weeks ago. Um, the second one we've had, but this one was much larger than anyone we've had before. So we know how much work uh, it takes to put on a conference like this. So I just want to thank all the volunteers and the staff and everybody, the musicians and um, everybody for all they've done. So... So it's a lot of work to do that, so we appreciate that a great deal. So I get the coveted spot of right after lunch to speak. Everybody's kind of just eating, you know, and kind of. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once said, defined preaching as the fine art of talking in someone else's sleep. So um, <laughs> I'm probably going to be, be doing a little bit of preaching here today, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, we're from Oklahoma, Cheryl and I. We love the weather out here. You know, Oklahoma is known for tornadoes, I think football and, and uh, oil, I think are the three things we're known for. So the weather here is tremendous. We, we love being out here anytime we get the opportunity to be here. I'm um, also in Oklahoma here. A lot of people go hunting out there. And there's a story about these three uh, guys that go deer hunting. Um, it's a pastor, a doctor, and a lawyer. And they're, they're out there hunting together, and they see this huge tro trophy buck come by, and they all, they all discharge at the same time this buck goes down, and, they, and it ensues a huge argument about which one of them shot this buck. So uh, they're arguing just, you know, vociferously about this. Well, finally, this, this uh, park ranger comes along, and he says, or game warden, he says, can I help you guys out? And they said, well, we all shot at the same time and hit this buck, and uh, we don't know which one of, of us uh, uh, killed it. So he says, well, let me look at it and see if I can give you some help. So he examines this, this uh, huge buck for just a few moments. And he looks at it and he said, well, it's clear to me that it's the pastor who shot this buck. And I said, well, how in the world would you know that? He said, well, the bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> so anyway, hopefully uh, that won't happen here right after lunch, you know, we, we, we go in one ear. Well, people everywhere today uh, seem to have a growing interest in signs of the times. You all I know since that, there's kind of a, a real palpable sense out there in our culture that even people that don't know anything about the Bible seem to have this sense that our world um, is getting near closing time. And uh, there's a lot of signs around, but not all the signs are as easy to read as the others. Um, here's a few signs that uh, people have seen in uh, uh, places around the world that weren't too easy to figure out. In a, in a Paris hotel elevator, it says, please leave your values at the front desk. Um, outside a Hong Kong tailor shop, there's a sign that says, ladies may have a fit upstairs. In a Rhodes tailor shop, order your summer suit because in a big rush, we'll execute customers in strict rotation. This is a good one here. In an advertisement by a Hong Kong dentist, teeth extracted by the latest Methodists. <clears throat> um, in an Acapulco hotel, there's a sign that said, the manager has personally passed all the water served here. <laughs> there's two ways you could take that. Um, and finally, uh, in a Copenhagen airline ticket office, it says, we take your bags and send them in all directions. <laughs> And uh, they certainly will uh, do that. But, but some signs are clearer to read than others. And some are pretty straightforward. Other signs are more difficult. But in the pages of the Bible, God has given us uh, some signs of the times. And today, as, as several of the speakers have mentioned, obviously we see the reestablishment of the nation of Israel, uh, world focus on the Middle East. Uh, we see the, uh, the increase of the rise of Iran um, in these last few decades. We see the explosion of apostasy, false teaching in churches, and deception. We see the rise of globalism. You have to have a, a global interconnected world like we have today for one man to be able to, to, to rule the entire world. So the signs we see all around us today are kind of like runway lights that are lighting up, that are indicating uh, that the coming of Christ um, is drawing near. And uh, there's a couple of quotes I wanted to read to you that I ran across here recently to think about this. The last two years, you've had COVID, and now we have this Russian invasion of Ukraine. And the author says these are two accelerants. They're accelerating things. First, the pandemic, now Ukraine, moving to the world in a whole new phase. Now, this person's not a believer, but just pointing out the changes those have brought. Two short years filled with levels of change that normally take decades. So things are being sped up. And just what's happened in the last two years with COVID, now with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, 
are speeding things up and accomplishing things that took decades. And then this last statement here, there's a reordering of the world at hyper speed. And that's what we see happening. I like to just use a simple illustration. It's like a, a prophetic shift of gears has taken place, really with COVID and now with what we see happening over in, in, in Russia and the Ukraine. But I, I think no sign is flashing more brightly today than the rise of Russia and its aggression and its expansionist policies and the growing alliances of Russia with a lot of bad actors. Um, Russia, the Russian bear, um, is on the prowl. Um, Russia today is like a mother bear uh, that's been robbed of her cubs because of the, the dissolution of the, of the uh, Soviet Union. They want to they get the empire back together again. Now, the most dangerous kind of bear is not a black bear. It's not a brown bear. It's not a grizzly bear. And we certainly know it's not a Chicago bear. Everybody knows that. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's a mother bear robbed of her cubs. And Vladimir Putin has never gotten over the breakup of the Soviet Union. And he called the dissolution of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. So Russia's trying to rebuild um, its empire. They went into to Georgia in uh, 2008. In fact, 20% of Georgia is still, still annexed by Russia. They went in and took Crimea in 2014. Uh, they've been in Syria since 2015. It's interesting, right there on the northern border of Israel in Syria, you have Russia and Iran present there. They're there bolstering the, the failing regime of Bashar al-Assad. And then, of course, now this Russian invasion um, of Ukraine. And they may make a lot more moves. We really don't know. We don't know what uh, Vladimir Putin may do. But Russia is playing, or Vladimir Putin's playing a dangerous game right now of Russian roulette. Um, a lot of people don't realize Russia has the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons in the world. Um, they have, think about this, Russia has one-eighth of the total land mass on the earth. If you realize, that's a massive, huge country. But they want more. And the crown jewel of Russia's expansionist aggression is the Ukraine. And what's happening in Ukraine has massive uh, geopolitical, military, humanitarian, and economic repercussions. We, we all see it on the news every night. Now, things could quickly spiral out of control. You know, something happens and Russia does something against a NATO uh, nation that would trigger Article 5, and all the NATO nations will have to come to their defense. <clears throat> Some believe, you know, as these dominoes start falling, this could trigger World War III. I've actually read several articles recently by people saying World War III is already here. Um, could Russia's move against uh, Ukraine embolden China to go take Taiwan? In other words, while the world's all busy with this, they're going to uh, go take Taiwan. Will Iran seize upon this chaos to unleash its, unleash its proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah, against Israel? I mean, Iran you know, fired some missiles into Iraq uh, near uh, the U.S. Uh, consulate there just uh, this last week or so. Uh, so certainly what's happening has massive geopolitical and economic ramifications. But most importantly, uh, this Russian roulette, this, this Russian invasion of Ukraine has profound prophetic implications. Uh, what's happening today reminds me of the words of Winston Churchill back right at the beginning of World War II. Um, he said this, Russia is a riddle wrapped up in a mystery inside an enigma. And uh, I think if you were to look at what's happening here today, it'd be kind of the same idea. So this afternoon, what I want to do is unwrap some of the mystery as we look into God's Word and what it says about Russia's present and its future. And uh, the biblical entry point for any discussion of Russia and Bible prophecy is Ezekiel 38 and 39. So if you'll take your Bible and uh, turn there with me to Ezekiel 38 and 39, I'm not going to read all of these chapters, but I want to just read the first eight verses to, uh, to get this section uh, before us. And we'll look at this and some of the other verses that are here as well. But I've titled this message, uh, Tracking the Bear, Ezekiel chapter uh, 38. Uh, verses uh, uh, 1 through 8, as I read this passage for us. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God, which, by the way, seven times in these two chapters you have, Thus says the Lord God. So that, that should hit us right at the beginning. This is the very word of God himself. Uh, the Bible is the breath of God. 
Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Turn you about, put hooks in your jaws. I'll bring you out, all your army, horses, horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer with all its troops, Bethel Garma from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. Be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companies that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you'll be summoned in the latter years, you'll come into the land that's restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, but its people were brought out from the nations, and they are living securely, all of them. Oh, may the Lord write that eternal word on our hearts. I'm here this afternoon. Now, when we we come to look at at current events and look at what's happening in our world today, one of the things that's very important is we always want to look at current events through the lens of the Bible, not the other way around. A lot of people just look at current events and try to go find something in the Bible that fits. We want to look at the Bible through the lens of God's Word, especially here in Ezekiel 38. Now, we're kind of parachuting down here in Ezekiel 38, kind of into the middle of this book. So let me help us get our bearings here in Ezekiel 38. Um, and, and kind of I've got an outline here of the book. Um, there you go. Um, what, what this book's all about, uh, Ezekiel writes this around 570 B.C. Ezekiel's a contemporary with Daniel and with Jeremiah. And uh, when Ezekiel's writing this book, it's judgment on Judah. The Babylonians are at the doorstep. Uh, in fact, they've already, uh, they've already come, and, and, and Ezekiel himself is taken in the second wave of deportation. Daniel goes in the first wave. Ezekiel in the second. But chapters 1 to 24 are judgment on Judah. And then in chapters 25 to 32, you have the judgment on the near enemies around Judah. You have nations like Philistia and Moab and Ammon and these places. And then chapter 33 is the pivot of the book. Um, Ezekiel's in Babylon, and he gets word that the city of Jerusalem has been destroyed. It's 586 B.C. The city's been destroyed, and from that point on, God recommissions Ezekiel and gives him another message. Now it's a message of hope for the future. So all this judgment on Judah, judgment on these surrounding nations, then this destruction of Jerusalem, now in in chapters 33 to 39, it's regathering and restoration, actually 33 to, 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 to 48 to the end of the book. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 is in this restoration section of the book. Now, obviously, this is a great observation. You have to be very educated to see this, but Ezekiel 38 and 39 comes right after chapter 37. So I know that's a brilliant observation, but Ezekiel 37 is the the valley of the dry bones where Judah and Israel come back together in the end times to their land. And we call this the super sign of the end times as the nation of Israel um, is reborn. In 1948, Jews came from 70 nations in the world after 2,000 years, and the modern state of Israel was reborn. And at that time, about 6% of the Jews lived in Israel. Now it's over 40% of the Jews in the world live in the the land of Israel. Really, uh, Israel today is the miracle on the Mediterranean. God has brought them back, and we've seen, we're seeing Ezekiel 37 literally being fulfilled before our eyes. It's God's bringing the, the people of Israel back to their land. By the way, God's watched over Israel all those years. Have you ever noticed every time somebody tries to wipe out the Jews, they end up with a holiday? Have you ever noticed that? You know, Pharaoh tried to wipe them out, and what do they get? They have Passover. In the book of uh, Esther, Haman tries to wipe them out, and they get the Feast of Purim. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes tried to wipe them out in the period between the, the Testaments. They end up with, with Hanukkah or the Feast of Lights. And of course, Adolf Hitler tried to wipe them out in the ovens of, of Germany in the 1930s, and the Jewish people ended up with, with uh, the uh, rebirth of their modern nation on, on May the 14th of 1948. So almost every prophecy hinges on the regathering of the nation of Israel. So it's the super sign. And again, that should be proof to us right there that Bible prophecy is true. We know what what Ezekiel 38 predicts is going to happen because we've actually witnessed with our own eyes at least the beginning of the fulfillment um, of, of Ezekiel chapter 37. So I've got five main points I want us to go through in this, in this chapter. Again, we'll just look at bits and pieces of it. We'll look at the Russian appearance 
uh, the Russian allies, the Russian attack, the Russian annihilation. And then I want to end with what I call the Russian application, just to apply this to our lives. But let's start here with the Russian appearance. Now, amazingly, over 2,500 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel predicted the, the rise of Russia to power, to global power in the latter days. And what's happening in Russia today casts a long shadow into the future uh, that's described in detail here in Ezekiel's prophecy. Now, when you read the Bible, you're not going to find the word Russia anywhere. You're not going to find the word Moscow or, or St. Petersburg or any of those statements. But I do believe, and a lot of other people do as well, that Russia figures prominently in these chapters. And there's three reasons I believe that. Now, notice in chapter 1, or in verse, I mean, in chapter 38, verse 2, Son of man, set your face toward Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, some of your translations won't have the word Rosh there. It'll have the word the chief prince. Because the word Rosh, it could be an adjective that just means chief or head, or it could be a proper noun that refers to a place. And I'm reading from the New American Standard, and it says the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And I think that's the better way to translate this here. Um, all the way back in the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word is translated here, Rosh. Um, all the way back in 1848, a, a great lexicographer, a Hebrew lexicographer, Wilhelm Gesenius, says here that Rosh is undoubtedly the Russians. Now, again, he wasn't looking at headlines to draw that conclusion. He drew it from his uh, study of, 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 uh, of lexicography. Uh, the other thing is, back in Ezekiel's day when he wrote this, there was a group of people that lived in the southern part of what is Russia today called the Ras or the Ros or the Rasapu people. And so, again, that fits what we see here. But another thing is, three times in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it says that the people who invade here come from the remotest parts of the north. Now, if you get a ruler and you draw it from Jerusalem straight north as far as you can go, uh, you go to Russia. And so, the remote parts of the north here, I think, is a, a, is a, a clue to us. This is talking about modern-day Russia. And also, a lot of Bible teachers believe that Magog that's mentioned here may be a reference to at least part of Russia as well. So that's the Russian appearance. Russia appears here, I think, in these verses in Scripture. Now, the Bible says that when Russia rises in the end times, Russia's not going to rise alone. Ezekiel 38 describes an invasion of Israel by Russia and an alliance of Islamic nations in the end times. So what we see today, we'll talk about this in a moment, but I don't think what we see today with Russia attacking Ukraine, that's not this prophecy of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38, because this is an invasion by Russia and some other nations into the land of Israel. But I do think what we see today is a preview because the kind of expansionism and aggression that we see today out of Russia is the same thing you see here in Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, notice here there's 10 proper names in Ezekiel 38, 1 to 6. Um, it's called often the Gog-Magog prophecy because it's Gog of the land of Magog. By the way, twice in the Quran, you have Gog and Magog mentioned. It's called Yajuj and Majuj. That's interesting. The Quran takes things that are in the Bible, and, and what it does is it counterfeits those and changes the meaning of them. You know, just like, you know, that uh, Abraham didn't take Isaac up onto the mountain. He took Ishmael up to the mountain. And here it's Yajuj and Majuj, and it's not an invasion of armies into Israel, but it's invading armies into Islamic countries. But anyway, they have this whole Gog, Magog prophecy that's a, a spinoff uh, from this that's false. But Gog here, the, notice it's Gog of the land of Magog. Gog here is the leader of this invasion. Um, we know that because Gog here is referred to as he's of the land of Magog, and God directly addresses Gog several times in this passage. So Gog's the leader of this um, invasion. The word Gog probably comes from a word that means darkness. So I don't think the person's name's literally going to be Gog, but Gog here's like a title, like Pharaoh or Caesar or president or something like that. Now, Another point I think is important, Gog, who's mentioned here, is not the same person as the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to lead the revived or reunited Roman Empire, a Western coalition of nations, whereas Gog here is leading a northern and mainly eastern coalition of nations. So they're not the same. 
Now, with all that's happening in Ukraine today, a lot of people are wondering, could Vladimir Putin be Gog? Um, certainly the entire structure of, Western, uh, of Russian power rests with him. There's questions right now about his health. There's questions about his mental health. Um, he's 69 years old. <clears throat> Some people are thinking, why is he doing this right now, what he's doing? Well, one is I think he senses weakness on the part of America. You know, our withdrawal from Afghanistan the way it was and uh, with the current president we have, I think he senses real weakness. But the other thing is, is he's 69 years old. He wants to recreate the Russian empire. And, you know, he's not going to wait till he's 80 years old probably to try to do that. I and mean, he's in office, by the way, he's, he's guaranteed to be president now until 2036. And he'd be 84 years of age. So he's, he's the new czar there. But there's a good quote, and I'll, uh, I'll get out of the way and read this for you. Um, from, this is from Joel Rosenberg from a few years ago. He says, over the years, people have asked me if Putin might be the Russian dictator referred to as Gog in the biblical prophecies of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Here's my quick answer. It's too soon to draw such a conclusion. There's much more that would have to happen to indicate that Putin was the Gog of Bible prophecy. But there's no question in my mind, I love this, Putin is Gog-esque. That's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, he's, he's dangerous, and both Israel and the West should keep a close and wary eye on him, especially given all that Putin's done to build a strategic alliance between Russia and Iran and the other countries mentioned in the Gog, Magog prophecies. So that's a really good statement, I think. You know, he can't be, we can't conclusively say that Vladimir Putin is Gog, but he can't conclusively be uh, eliminated either. Um, Putin and his relationship to God kind of reminds me of what one of the Puritans said years ago about the Pope being the Antichrist. Now, I don't think the Pope's the Antichrist, but this is what uh, one of these Puritans said. If the Pope be not the Antichrist, he has the ill look of looking very much like him. And I think the same is true of Vladimir Putin. If he, if he be not Gog, he has the ill luck of looking very much like him. So again, time will tell. What well, we can say, again, he's, he, he can't be definitively identified nor conclusively ruled out. He may be setting the stage for another ruler who's waiting in the wings. You know, Jack Hibbs, as he spoke earlier, said he, he thinks, you know, that, that Putin's days are numbered. You know, he may not be around much longer. They're going to take him out. That's possible. But at a very minimum, Putin is a foreshadow, a frightening foreshadow of what's coming. So the commander of this coalition is this person, Gog. But then it goes on and lists all the nations as part of this coalition, and nine other geographical locations are given. Now, none of these places exist on a modern map. You don't find Meshach or Togarma or Gomer or Put. Now, these are ancient names that give geographical locations back in Ezekiel's day. So today we're not looking for you know, Gog or, or, or for Magog or Meshach or Tubal on a map, we're looking for the modern counterparts of these places. So where were these places back then, and what's the modern counterpart uh, today? Now, again, as I said, I believe Rosh is Russia. Uh, Magog that's mentioned here was the land of the ancient Scythians, you know, Central Asia. Um, it's probably the, the underbelly of the old Soviet Union. I, I call those nations the stands, you know, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, which, by the way, are, are, are Islamic countries. And just a few months ago, Vladimir Putin sent troops into Kazakhstan uh, to help put down a, a revolt that was there. But some people believe, uh, in fact, uh, Charles Ryrie, a lot of you have the, the Ryrie Study Bible, he believed that Magog, part of Magog was Ukraine. And he said this, you know, years ago before this happened, probably 40 years ago. So if that's true, Putin's move into Ukraine could be a key part of the buildup here of what's happening. Now, let me just pause here for a moment and say something. Uh, uh, Jack Hibbs mentioned this earlier. When we see these things that are happening, like the invasion of Ukraine, we're not rejoicing that it's happening. <laughs> We need to be praying for the people of Ukraine, but we do look at the Bible and say, this does seem to fit some things the Bible says. Um, I've got a, a friend who's been to our church many times. He's the president of the, the Kiev or Kiev Theological Seminary. I mean, he's about my age. He's had to flee uh, to Poland. Um, his wife's gone with him. Um, his, he has a, a daughter named Natalia, a son named Alex. Uh, they were both in, my, in classes of mine at Dallas Seminary that I have the privilege to teach. And um, 
I remember the last conversation I had with him before they were going back to Kiev. He went back there to teach at the seminary. It's under a street light at night, right across from the dorm where they lived. And I, pr- I prayed for them, and you know that they headed off, and they were graduating, going back there to teach, having no idea what's going to happen in their lives now. They have two beautiful little daughters, Alex. Um, he's had to stay behind with his brother because you know if you're between uh, 18 and uh, 60 as a male, you can't leave. But his wife's gone now with his two daughters, with his father-in-law, with his mother-in-law. I've talked to him several times on the phone. Um, He lives there now in a refugee camp. Uh, We've been sending money over to him, wiring money, because he said most of the people coming to this camp have no money. And so he's he's taking money that we're sending him and helping distribute it to other people in need. So uh, at the same time we think about these things and the prophetic significance of them, we want to also do what we can to help people are her need and to pray for them. So if you think of, of Alex and Natalia, that's this young couple, and uh, the father's name is Anatoly Prokupchik. Um, it's devastating. And, and to sit there and talk to a young man, it's surreal. The other night I was telling, uh, Cheryl was listening into a conversation. I was talking to Alex. There I am sitting in my leather chair in my office. I just had a nice dinner. I'm kind of doing some studying and reading. And here I am talking to him thousands of miles away, and he's in a refugee camp over in Ukraine. And sit there and just think about, you know, why do I have all that I have? You know, they have so much trouble and struggle there in their lives. By the way, it needs to make every one of us, we get up every day, thank God for what we have in this country. I mean, our, our country's got problems. It's not perfect, but it's the best place in the world to live. And there's no doubt about that. So anyway, I just want to mention that. We want to be in prayer. I pray for them every day. Um, it also mentions here Meshach and Tubal. Uh, Meshach and Tubal. Those are in modern-day Turkey. Uh, The old Schofield Bible used to have Moscow and Tobolsk for these two places, but it's Meshach and Tubal. It's modern-day Turkey. On down in verse 6, you have Gomer and Beth Togarma. Beth in Hebrew just means house of, so house of Togarma. Gomer and Beth Togarma are also in modern-day Turkey. Now, this is the one part of this that doesn't yet fit because think about this. Turkey's part of NATO, right? They're part of the NATO alliance, so that's kind of the, the fly in the ointment here, but Turkey is an Islamic country. I mean, their president, Erdogan, is, uh, um, you know, I think fairly radical in his views on Islam. And so one of the things we have to say when we read the Bible is there's going to be a lot of twists and turns before the ultimate result takes place. But whenever we get to the end times, Turkey is going to be a part of this coalition that's going to come down um, into the land of Israel. Uh, Down in verse uh, uh, 5, you have put that's mentioned there. Uh, Put is modern-day Libya, which has been in chaos, and and Russia has exerted a lot of influence there um, in recent years. Uh, You have, uh, of course, in verse 5, the beginning of the verse is Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Um, Again, I loved what Jack said earlier about all the people uh, hearing the gospel in Iran today. So we love the Iranian people. We want the Iranian people to come to Christ. The problem is the regime there that runs the country. That's always the problem. That's the problem in Russia. It's the leaders there. In fact, uh, Joel Rosenberg called it the, the Mullah regime in Iran an apocalyptic genocidal death cult. That's pretty descriptive. But they have this apocalyptic view of the Mahdi coming back, and, and they want to wipe out uh, the Jewish people. Um, they're on the verge of crossing the nuclear finish line. I hear all kinds of different time periods, but the, the best I've heard is within about, they're about 60 days away from having enough nuclear material for a weapon. And we're over there trying to get back into this, uh, this nuclear deal with them, which uh, uh, to me is insanity, but uh, that's, that's, where, that's where we are. And again, it can be part of God's plan of what he's working out. Uh, they have ballistic missiles, too, that can reach Israel. And that's, the, that's the, the, the thing that you don't want. You don't want people with nuclear weapons to also have ballistic missiles. By the way, the, they've named their newest ballistic missile they have, or their, it's named Kabar, which is a castle in Israel that was overrun by warriors led by the prophet Muhammad. So if that tells you anything, they've named their missile after a place in Israel that was overrun by Muhammad. So that's what they've named the missile. Um, Jerusalem Post had an article recently that said how war in Ukraine increases Iran's threat to Israel. With all the chaos going over there, and if, if China were to invade Taiwan, that'd be the perfect time then for Iran to try to strike Israel with all the chaos that's happening. They, they may exploit this chaotic time to unleash Hamas and, and, and Hezbollah against Israel. 
And again, as I mentioned earlier, Russia and Iran, since 2015, have troops in Syria perched right there on the northern border of Israel. I mean, think about that. They're right there. Here we have this prophecy of uh, a great invasion from the north. You also have uh, Ethiopia mentioned here, which actually in verse 5, Ethiopia, though, in in, in, uh, Hebrew, it's the word Cush. And in that day, Cush was the nation just south of Egypt, which is modern-day Sudan. And uh, north, uh, the, the nation of Sudan divided. You have Sudan and then South Sudan. But Sudan is a radical Islamic nation, and they've just entered into, uh, uh, I think, finalized the uh, negotiations for Russia to have a naval port on the Red Sea uh, there with Sudan. So Russia's involved in, in a lot of major ways in Sudan. So I just say all that to say this Gog coalition is coalescing. And the exact nations that God predicted 2,500 years ago are currently developing ties with one another. Now, to me, this is a fascinating proof of the inspiration of the Bible. I mean, God predicted this all that time ago. Israel's back in the land. These nations are coming together. I'm at just the right time. Now, notice down in verse 6, the very end there, he says, many peoples with you. So what a lot of people will say is it may be more nations than just the ones I've mentioned. A lot of people will point out you have Israel, and then you have Russia, and you have Iran, and you have kind of Libya and Sudan. You have these nations. These are often called kind of the far enemies of Israel, kind of the outer ring of enemies. But it may include the nations inside of that. Because you'll notice here it doesn't mention Jordan. It doesn't mention Saudi Arabia. Well, it may mention them later, but not in this context. Um, doesn't mention Syria, doesn't mention Egypt, some of the kind of you know, long-standing enemies of Israel. So it may just be mentioning this outer ring, but it includes the nations within, within that. In other words, many peoples with you. Now, one other thing I'll mention here that you might want to look at on your own later, down in verse 13 of chapter 38, when Russia and these nations invade Israel in the end times. It says that there's a group of nations that are going to make a protest to this, kind of a lame protest. Notice verse 13, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all its villages will say to you, if you come to capture spoil, you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods to capture great spoil. So Sheba is probably modern-day Yemen. Uh, that's where the queen of Sheba, remember, came to visit Solomon. Uh, Dedan probably is, is more of the, the Gulf states, kind of these more uh, moderate Gulf states. And the merchants of Tarshish, some people think that's America, uh, that America could be cl- included in that. I just think it refers to the Western nations. You know, what we'd say today is Western Europe. Because Tarshish, remember when uh, Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh? He was supposed to go east. He was going to go as far west as he could go to Tarshish. It was a a Phoenician colony, probably in modern-day Spain. So probably this is just referring to Western nations. But doesn't that kind of sound like the UN today? You've got this massive Russian Islamic coalition. What do they do? What are you doing? You come in to, to capture spoil? Um, you know, they just kind of raise this verbal protest, but they don't really do anything. And so again, you see how things are aligned and not only in that the enemies are going to come against Israel, but you see the the nations that will object to what's happening also aligned today with kind of these moderate Gulf states and Western nations. So these are kind of the nations that are on the sidelines. So you have the Russian appearance, do we have this Russian alliance, and then you have the Russian attack. After cataloging uh, the coalition of Russian allies, Ezekiel goes on to describe the attack of Israel, where these nations pour down into the land. And when we track the bear in Bible prophecy, we find that Russia's footprints lead straight into the land of Israel. Now, why will Russia and these nations attack Israel? What's the purpose of this attack? Well, there's three reasons given in this text, or two specific ones, and another one that's implied. Down in uh, verse 12, he says, you come to capture spoil and seize plunder. Down at the very end of verse 13, to capture great spoil. 
So they're going to come to seize great spoil in the land of Israel. Now, people used to wonder years ago, what are they going to come get in the land of Israel? People talked about, well, down by the Dead Sea, there's all kinds of minerals down there. But all of a sudden, a few years ago, they start uh, discovering these gargantuan oil and gas reserves in the land of Israel. Now, I remember one of the early prime ministers of the modern state of Israel was Golda Meir. And she used to joke that God led the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness and brought them to the only place in the Middle East without any oil. Uh, But that's not true any longer. Now, there's huge, massive gas reserves there. And just a a couple weeks ago, there's an article in the Jerusalem Post that says this, the Russian-Ukraine war may be a gas opportunity for Israel, that Israel's going to begin to supply gas to Europe because so much of it's coming in. Uh, from from, uh, Russia at this time. By the way, the the pipeline that was going from Russia to Germany that I guess they've taken offline now, Russia got a billion dollars a day for that. Not so much they got a billion dollars a day. But, you know, European countries want to get off and get weaned off of this, this Russian gas. And so Israel could become a major player in that, which, again, is going to cause Russia to be jealous. I mean, hey, you know, Israel now has gotten this money from us. So this could all be part of it. It could be part of, in verse 4, what's called the hooks and the jaws that pulls them uh, down there uh, into that area. So they're going to come to capture spoil. They're going to come just to crush Israel. I mean, down in verse 9, it says, you'll come like a, a storm, like a cloud covering the land, you and tr- the, the many people with you. They're going to come down into the, the, the land of Israel to steal the land and to slaughter the people. And again, if you look at Russia, and you think about Iran, and you think about Sudan, and you think about Libya, think about these nations today, there's nothing they would rather do, and especially if the inner nations are included as well, there's nothing they'd rather do than to drive uh, the Jewish people um, into the sea. By the way, really interesting, not lo- just uh, the day before Russia invaded Ukraine, there was a meeting in the United Nations about Israel, and Russia condemned the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights. You've been to Israel, the Golan Heights is that northern part of Israel that has been disputed between Israel and Syria. But just hours before that invasion, they said that, that uh, Israel's occupation of the Golan Heights was not valid and that they didn't recognize the sovereignty of Israel over the Golan Heights. Now, by the way, uh, President Trump was the first U.S. president to say that uh, the Golan Heights is part of Israel. And of course, moves the embassy from um, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But to me, fascinating here, you think, you think Russia had enough on their plate, you know, at that point in time, rather than thinking about Israel and saying the, that they don't recognize Jewish sovereignty over the Golan Heights. And that's right where Russian troops are, Iranian troops are. Um, whenever you've been to Israel before, any of you go up to the northern border, you're, there are the Golan, you can look right over into the land of Syria. Um, also, another reason I think that, it, that they're going to invade, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, the timing of this, but... I believe this invasion, part of it, is going to be to challenge the Antichrist. Because here in a moment, I'll I'll make this point. During the first three and a half years of the coming tribulation period, after the rapture, the tribulation period comes, that during that first three and a half years, Israel's going to be living under a peace agreement with the Antichrist, have a guaranteed peace. And so when they have this guaranteed peace with the Antichrist, the leader of the West, as as Russia and these other nations come into Israel, they're coming to wipe out Israel. But since Israel has a covenant with uh, this Western leader, it's also going to be an attack against the West. And what do we see with Russia today that they're trying to do? They hate NATO, right? They hate the West. They're trying to fragment NATO. So it fits this the whole situation uh, we see today. And his, uh, really, uh, Putin's challenge of the West today is a preview and a precursor of this. Now, one other point here I want to look at is when's this invasion going to take place? Because you, know, you get asked when things like this happen with Russia invading Ukraine, you think people say, is this the beginning of Ezekiel 38 and 39 of Gog and Magog? So what's the timing of this? Some people believe that Ezekiel 38 describes an invasion that's already happened. So, well, why would they say that? Well, look at verse 4. He talks about horses and horsemen, um, bucklers, shields, swords. So they say, well, look, if this is in the end times, why are people riding horses and fighting with shields and, and with swords? Well, there's a couple ways to explain this. One is it could be um, that he's just mentioning ancient weapons and means of transportation that he was familiar with, but we would transfer that to the modern counterpart to that. 
Just like you know, there's no Magog or Meshach on a map, we look for the modern counterpart of that. In other words, you know, he didn't write tanks and rocket launchers. He just wrote about what they would have known, but we would expect the modern counterpart of that. But some actually believe that it could be in the end times it's going to get so bad that people will actually have reverted to these kinds of weapons. Now, you look at our world today, I mean, how quickly things can, can uh, uh, devolve. We were talking earlier about you know, supply chain and food and with famine and the just destruction in our world. That was actually the view of Dr. John Walford. Some of you may know that name, the president of Dallas Seminary for so many years that, that I learned so much from. That was his view. It's going to devolve, and that's literally what they're going to be using. Um, Albert Einstein put it like this. He said, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. And again, I mean, Einstein was no dummy, so he, he, knew, he knew a few things. But that could be true. could be what uh, Ezekiel is describing. But either way, this invasion cannot be passed because a couple times in this chapter, he says it's going to be in the latter years. It's going to be in the last days. And also nothing even remotely similar to this has ever happened in, in Israel's history. So it has to be sometime in the future. Now, if we look at the future, some people say, well, I think this is going to happen actually before the tribulation or maybe even before the rapture. Some of you remember the Left Behind uh, books. Um, that was actually the first event in the first Left Behind book was this Russian, called it the Russian Pearl Harbor as uh, they, they attack uh, the land of Israel. I don't place it there before the tribulation because, um, to me, it's in the latter years or the last days for Israel. And if it happens before the rapture, we're still within the church age. And it seems to me this is going to happen after the church age has ended. By the way, one of the reasons people put it before the rapture is in chapter 39, verse 9, it says at the end of this invasion, they're going to burn the, the weapons for seven years. So a lot of people, they see that and they think, well, if they're going to burn the weapons seven years, then this happens at some point before the rapture, and they burn these weapons kind of before the tribulation starts and into the tribulation period a bit. So that is appealing to this view, but I don't think it, it fits all the facts because, again, this is the latter years or the last days uh, for, for Israel. Um, a lot of people put this at the end of the tribulation. They say this is the same as Armageddon, the very end of the seven-year tribulation period. Um, I don't think that that's true. The, the reason people say that is they'll say, well, if you read over in chapter 39, it says that when this invasion takes place at the end of it, birds and beasts come and feed on the bodies and the carnage that's there. Same thing you have in Revelation 19 at the Battle of Armageddon. The problem with that is whenever this invasion happens, it says in verse 8 and verse 11 that Israel's going to be at rest and they're going to be living securely. And the one time we know when Israel won't be at rest and living securely in the future is at the end of the tribulation period. And they're going to have just been going through seven years or at least three and a half years of, of hell on earth. Um, also in Ezekiel 38, it's specific nations that are mentioned. At Armageddon, it says it's going to be all the nations. And in Ezekiel 38 here, the leader is Gog. At Armageddon, the leader is the Antichrist. So it can't be them. Um, one other thing, I'll just mention this quickly. The only other time Gog and Magog is mentioned in the Bible is all the way back in, in, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the end of the millennium? Satan's going to be led up out of the abyss. He's going to come gather people from all over the earth to rebel against Christ. And they're going to come against him and be defeated. And it's called Gog and Magog. So people say, well, that's the same Gog and Magog as here. The problem with that is is this passage in Ezekiel 38 is before the millennium because Ezekiel 40 to 48 describe a, a, a millennial temple that's going to be built. So it's before the millennium. Revelation 20 is after the millennium or, or the end of it. Um, the, other, the other point I, I would just uh, give is that um, Gog and Magog, the way it's used here, could just be being used symbolically in the book of Revelation in the sense that it's a literal invasion. But, you know, we'll talk about the Battle of Waterloo. You'll say, you know, so-and-so faced their Waterloo. Well, you don't really mean it was the Battle of Waterloo again. It's just, it's a massive annihilation. Or you could call Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 kind of Gog and Magog 1. And in Revelation 20, it's kind of Gog and Magog 2. Or like, kind of like World War I and World War II. So that's the way um, I, see the, I see this playing out. So where I put this is early in the tribulation period. 
There's only two times in Israel's future that we know from Scripture they're going to be at rest and living securely. In the millennium, when there's not going to be any war, and then the first half of the coming time um, of the tribulation period. So Israel's going to be living under their treaty with the Antichrist in this guaranteed peace. Again, verse 8 says they're living securely. Verse uh, 11 says they're going to be uh, at rest and living securely. And that's when I think it's going to take place. So, yeah, this is a really good slide from Tommy Ice and Tim LaHaye's book, uh, Charting the End Times. So just to get our bearings, this is where we are right now. We're over here in the current church age. And at any moment of time, the rapture of the church could take place. And we're going to get an airlift accompanied by a facelift. It's going to be good. Those of us who are alive and remain when the rapture happens. So the rapture will take place. And this is, uh, this is a worth, worth the admission price if you don't get anything else from what I say today. Um, think about this. The rapture doesn't start the seven-year tribulation. You all aware of that? You know, we often just think the rapture takes place and then the seven-year tribulation starts. The rapture, the purpose of the rapture is to end the church age. It will end the church age. Just like the church started suddenly and dramatically the day of Pentecost, it's going to end suddenly and dramatically at the rapture. But when the rapture takes place, the tribulation might not start for a month after that, or maybe two months, maybe a year, two years. Now, I don't think it's going to be really long afterwards because part of the purpose of the rapture is to deliver us from the coming wrath. So if it's too far away, we don't need to be raptured. But there's going to be some time gap here, a time of further preparation. Then the Antichrist will come on the scene at some point, and he'll broker this peace treaty with Israel, uh, this seven-year treaty. That will begin the tribulation period. And for that first three and a half years, Israel is going to be at peace. And that's when I think this army is going to descend down into Israel, this massive army, to try to take them out and also to try to challenge uh, the power um, of the Antichrist. And again, um, a, a couple of years ago, with uh, you know, President Trump brokered those uh, Abraham Accords. You remember that? They were signing. And just, it's interesting. There's kind of, Israel's kind of been, been getting at least not really peace per se, but they've been getting um, you know, normalized relations with some of these uh, nations that, that used to be their inveterate enemies. By the way, I think another thing about this, whenever this, this uh, Russian Islamic coalition is, is destroyed in this first three and a half years, that's going to create a massive power vacuum in the world. And that's one of the things that I think will catapult the Antichrist to power. In other words, these nations are wiped out. He's going to seize that, this power vacuum, and it's going to be one of the things that allows him to come to power and rule the whole world for that last three and a half years. Well, the final thing, just to, he climaxes this prophecy by describing the Russian annihilation. What's going to happen? Well, I won't read it to you. You can read it yourself. But uh, what happens when Gog uh, meets God? Well, it's going to look like Israel is finished. It's going to look like the greatest mismatch in history, but God is going to step in and destroy these armies. We talk about the six-day war in Israel in 1967. This will be the one-day war when God comes in and annihilates uh, these enemies. And um, it's, it's, you know, God uses uh, fire and brimstone from heaven and, and infighting by the enemies. It's going to be the, the, the worst case of death by friendly fire in military history. As God destroys these enemies. And by the way, on in chapter 39, it says about Israel, then they will know that I'm the Lord. I think this is going to be a massive turning point in, in Israel's history where they begin to, to turn uh, to Jesus uh, during the tribulation period. At least many of them do. But the aftermath of this invasion, you have the birds and the beasts. You have the burying of the dead. You have the burning of the weapons uh, that takes place. And you can read about that on your own. But, you know, it just shows how God can just effortlessly destroy um, his enemies. You know, we see, you know, Putin in Russia today and Xi in China and the Ayatollah in Iran. I was reminded of this. I read a story by Dale Ralph Davis some time back. He talks about the aftermath of World War II. They had the Nuremberg Trials. You remember that? And in uh, October of 1946, uh, 16 or 14 of the Nazi leaders were executed on, on October the 16th of 1946. Their bodies were cremated. And they didn't want anybody, they didn't want to bury them and have a tomb there where people would go you know, and worship them over the years. So they cremated their bodies. 
and they took their accumulated ashes of these 14 men, they put them in a, in a, in a, in a, a container, and they drove them out in a car in, through the rain out into the Bavarian countryside. And here's what Dale Ralph Davis says. After an hour's drive, the vehicle stopped and the ashes were poured into a muddy ditch. Five or six years earlier, these men dominated and intimidated the world. That night, a drizzle washed them away. That's a powerful picture. Reminds us, too, how temporary our lives are. Think about the people today that are dominating and intimidating the world. One of these days, they don't come to the Lord. A drizzle is just going to come and wash them away. We need to think about that. If God's power, I mean, in comparison to those that people fear today so much in our world. Well, look, we can draw some conclusions from this as we close here. What's happening today in our world is consistent with Ezekiel 38. There's a remarkable correspondence between this chapter and what we see happening today. What's happening in Ukraine is not the fulfillment of this, but I think it's a foreshadow um, of what's coming. Again, Ukraine may be part of Magog. Uh, that's mentioned here in this passage. The kind of expansionism and aggression we see on the part of Russia is consistent uh, with, with uh, what we see here in Ezekiel 38. We see uh, Iran as this uh, dominant power that wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. So again, what we see today is not fulfillment, but it's the foreshadow. It's the setting the stage or the buildup of all this. So uh, the, the buildup now to me, I think, has gone into overdrive. There's like this shift of prophetic gears uh, that's taking place in all that we see happening in our world today. And again, there's going to be all kinds of twists and turns that will take place. What you and I are seeing today is the setup and the buildup for the, for, for the end. Now, one of the things that you and I need to remember in times like this is that God is in control of what's happening. God is sovereign over nations and dictators. God rules over everything. It's like the person that uh, visited their psychic one time, and they got there, and there was a sign on the door that said, closed due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> and I like that there, there are no unforeseen circumstances with God. Um, there's never panic in heaven. Think about that. There's never panic in heaven. The Trinity never has to meet an emergency session. I mean, God knows what's happening in this world today. And God is in control uh, of what's happening in, in, in our world today. And you and I, uh, by God's grace, can read the Scriptures and know a lot of what's coming in the future. And it should give us a sense that God's in control of what's happening and give us a sense of calm and peace in the midst of all the turbulence and turmoil. Uh, several years ago, uh, my, my wife and I were both graduates of Oklahoma State University. Back in 2011, uh, they went to their first uh, uh, New Year's, uh, New Year's Day Bowl. They went to the Fiesta Bowl down in, in Arizona. So we got our whole family, and we had, hadn't had the chance to do this, and went down there and got a house and, and uh, played golf a couple days and went to the game. And I know none of you remember the game, but um, they were playing Stanford, and Andrew Luck was the quarterback at Stanford, a very well-known uh, player. And so we got there, and, and uh, Stanford goes out to a pretty good lead. And one of my sons and myself, my wife says we're pessimists. We call ourselves realists. Uh, but my wife and my other son are very optimistic. So me and the other realist son, we're thinking, man, they're going to get killed. This is no good. You know, we've spent all our money coming here. We had a good time, whatever, you know. So the game goes along, and it rolls along. Finally, at the end, uh, Stanford's driving. They, they're just killing off the time to kick a, a field goal to win the game. Their kicker comes out there. I mean, this is a short field goal, as you can imagine. I mean, just hooks the thing to the left like you can't believe, misses it. So and we just, all of our fans go crazy. And so it goes into overtime. So they get into overtime. They can't get a touchdown. So in overtime, they cry another field goal. God just shanks this one to the right. I mean, it's horrible. So OSU gets the ball in the overtime. They go down. They plunge in. They score a touchdown. Um, OSU wins the game, and our fans go wild. And I don't know if anybody here is a graduate of Stanford. I know I'll offend you, but I couldn't stand the Stanford band during the game. I mean, these are the most obnoxious group of people I've ever seen. And so I was happy we won just to watch them suffer. I have to admit it at the end of the game. So... Um, but anyway, it was good, man. We, we stayed there late that night. And if, if there's any Stanford band members, I'm sure I'll get beat later. Um, but we stayed there late. And so we get back to the, this place we're staying. And um, we get some sandwiches out and whatever. We're just, you know, this is just awesome, man. We're celebrating. One of my sons turns on ESPN. It's the kickoff of the game that we just finished watching. They're replaying it already. Now, this time, me and the realist son, man, we're relaxed this time, man. We're just enjoying the game and no sweat, right, or anything. Why are we relaxed this time? 
We know what's going to happen, right? Yeah, we, we lay in there in bed about 2 in the morning, and my wife wants to keep watching the game. Finally, I told her, man, I want to go to sleep, and we know how it ends. We don't have to worry about it, so click it off and put up the channel changer. But it changes everything when you know what the outcome will be. Now, we don't know everything that's going to happen in the world. God's told us a lot of what's coming. There's a lot we don't know. But we do know the ultimate final outcome. And because of that, you and I can have peace in the midst of a world uh, today that's in so much turmoil. And I like what Corey Ten Boom said years ago. She said, look around, you get distressed. Look within, you get depressed. But look to Christ and you'll find rest. And that's what you and I need today. You look around today, you get distressed. And if you look within long enough, you're going to get depressed <laughs> if you look at yourself and your life. But you look to Christ and you find rest. So we need to be Christ-centered people in these days in which we live because that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for Antichrist. We're looking for Christ. And here's another thought that I think is beautiful. You just think about how God has orchestrated all these nations to rise at the right time, all these global events. If the whole world is in God's hands, that means your world is in God's hands. If God can control nations and kingdoms, He can control your life and my life. God has your world and my world in his hands. The other thing just from this, and we all know this, Christ is coming back and he can come at any moment. The rapture is possible any day. It's impossible no day. It can happen at any moment in time. We can wake up every day and say, perhaps today, today might be the day when Jesus is coming. Let me just read this quote by E.W. Tozer, and I'll close here in a moment. Um, This is a great statement by Tozer. He was certainly no no prophecy fanatic, but this is what he said. Let us be alert to the season in which we are living. And by the way, he wrote this decades ago. Let us be alert to the season in which we are living. This is the season of the blessed hope. It is imperative that we stay fully alert to the times in which we live. All signs today point to this being the season of the blessed hope. All around us, we have the evidence of Jesus' soon return. Each day, uh, we should focus on the coming one. And listen to this. Our focus on the blessed hope is the most important discipline of our Christian life. That's fascinating. The most important discipline of the Christian life is to keep focused um, on uh, the blessed hope of the coming of Jesus Christ. Of course, make sure you know Christ. I, mean, I assume uh, most of you that would uh, <clears throat> come out on a Saturday like this to listen to Bible prophecy teachers know the Lord, but people may be watching or watch this some later time. Uh, make sure you know Christ. Uh, uh, my favorite Bible verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so we could become the righteousness of God in him. And the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved ever done that, call upon Jesus, he'll save you. Look, Jesus is coming for those who've come to him. If you've not come to him, he's not coming for you. He's coming back uh, for those uh, who've come to him. So let's live for him. Prophecy is always given to change us, not to just entertain us. Um, It's not given to scare us, but to prepare us. It's not been given to make us anxious, but to make us aware. It's not just to satisfy our curiosity. It's to shape our character. Again, the statement I've heard many use here recently, things aren't falling apart, they're falling into place. We need to remember that in our world today as we watch the news. So I'll leave you with this. You can write this down. This is a great little statement. We need to pray for revival, prepare for survival, and get ready for arrival. I love that. So amen. Let's pray together. Let me, uh, let me lead us in prayer. Father, Uh, We come before you today, and I pray if there's anyone who hears this message now or maybe hear it at some later point who's without Christ, uh, that they'll come to him, that they'll trust in that one who uh, paid the full pardon, Lord, for all their sins. They'll trust in him. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Uh, Father, I I pray for the people of Ukraine today. Uh, We pray for the people there whose lives are just turned upside down. Um, Again, I pray for Anatoly and his family and Natalia and Alex. Uh, Lord, uh, have your hand of protection upon them. And uh, we pray, Father, you tell us in your word in the Proverbs that uh, the, the heart of a king is just like a channel of water in your hands. And I pray that you'll move the, the, the channels of water in the heart of Vladimir Putin to withdraw his troops, to, to take another course and to save life and, uh, there, there in Ukraine. Father, we, we, we pray for the people there. We pray for the church there, the, be, the believers, that they'll rise up in this difficult time and they'll shine. And that they'll hold forth the gospel to those around them who need it so desperately. Uh, Father, help us to live godly lives as we await the coming of Christ. Help us to understand our times. Help us to be like men and women 
who are waiting for their master uh, to return. Father, thank you for Pastor Rob. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our time together in this conference. Father, may your rich hand of blessing rest upon us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank